Good morning. Uh, so according to my clock, it's 1045. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started at least introducing myself. Uh, my name is Jonathan Cahayas. I'm a principal consultant with SQL Skills. And this session is eliminating anti-patterns and row by agonizing row processing for faster performance. So if you have a cell phone, uh, if you could just double check, make sure that it's on silent. Uh, if you need to take a call during the session, it's not a problem. Just say, hey, give me a second and, and take it out into the hallway so you don't interrupt other attendees. Um, how many people here are at their first past summit ever? Lots of newcomers. That's awesome. So um, there's a lot of resources. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this slide in almost every session that you've attended. Uh, but there's a lot of different resources that pass offers for the community for SQL Server. Uh, so <clears throat> as I said a second ago, my name is Jonathan Cahayas. Uh, it's really embarrassing. Uh, somebody who attended my pre-con pointed out that I don't know how to spell my own name last night to me. Um, and the sad thing is that I have used this slide for almost a year and a half to introduce myself, and it's misspelled in every one of my decks. <laughs> Nobody caught it or told me about it. So I'm very appreciative to my friend from the Netherlands who told me last night, you don't know how to spell your name. Um, I do work at SQL Skills. Uh, I'm available online through a lot of different mediums. Uh, I am on Twitter as SQL Pool Boy. It's a really bad joke that got published in a book, and I've been stuck with that name for 10 years. It wasn't supposed to be that. Um, you can reach me by email, jonathan at sqlskills.com. I always say if you have any questions about something that I talked about, you can't find the demos or you're having a problem with the demo, feel free to send uh, me an email. I'll be happy to uh, answer it. So this session is a part of one of the past summit learning pathways. And it's part of the SQL performance for developer pathway that started with my coworker Aaron Stellato uh, presenting on execution plans yesterday. And then Bert Wagner presented uh, I want to go faster in introduction to indexing. This is more about coding patterns that don't go fast or coding patterns that are going to result in slow execution times, or what we consider rebar, row by agonizing row, loop-based processing in SQL Server. So what we're going to talk about are the different patterns that lead to row by row processing. Uh, the database engine for SQL Server is designed around set-based execution. And just because it doesn't look like it's doing row by row work doesn't mean that that's not what's actually happening, right? So if we can keep our queries and we can make the execution function against sets of data in autonomous operations, it'll be much faster. So we're going to go over a number of different row by row processing uh, concepts and coding paradigms that are very common that lead to performance problems. As a consultant, one of the first things that I look for when I'm looking at performance issues is are there row by row constructs, things that are going to make SQL Server have to run um, through result sets, iterating processes. And then we're going to talk about sargability. Um, sargability means uh, search argument able. It's where we design where clauses that allow indexes to be seeked against rather than scanned. And there are certain coding patterns that are very prevalent and very common that lead to non-sargable criteria, things that have to do index scans. So we're going to talk about what those are and some of the ways that we can correct or mitigate those along the way. Now, row by agonizing row processing has a lot of different um, constructs. Uh, some of the well-known ones, while loops or cursors, right? Who here writes cursors regularly? A few people. So they have their place. Um, but I, as an early developer with SQL Server, um, I use cursors as a crutch. And unfortunately, um, as a consultant at one point, I had to go back and look at code that I had written previously. Uh, and it was a report I wrote that had about, I, I, it was 12 cursors nested in inside of each other that iterated and looped. 
And when I got the code, <laughs> um, and it was a former employer that hired me back to just help with, with some things. And they gave me this code and I said, who wrote this? And uh, the response was, you did. And I was like, well, you should fire that person. So, uh, so developers often think in terms of looping over collections of information, right? It's one of the things, it's, it's just a part of the way that you do object-oriented coding or other coding strategies. And I always like to jokingly say when I'm working with clients that I used to be a developer, so I understand developer think. And I have been a DBA, and I understand DBA think. So I'm a multifaceted threat. Um, I can write really bad code, and I'm really good at writing really bad code, but I can also identify really bad code and come from the database administration standpoint and say this is how you would do this in a set-based manner, right? So, that's what we're going to talk about, is how do we replace some of these conditions? Um, there are things that cursors are still re required for, right? And if, if it's the right tool, uh, by all means, it's the right tool. But if we can eliminate the need to use those, we can make performance significantly faster when we're talking about query execution. Some of the less well-known, though, scalar user-defined functions. Right? A scalar user-defined function iterates row by row. Even if it does absolutely nothing, it's going to impact performance. I, as a consultant, call scalar UDFs easy money. Because I could spend the rest of my life working with the customer databases that are out there that have scalar UDF issues, eliminating performance problems, and I, I would never be without work. It's just, it's such an inherent part of the design of certain systems that uh, is problematic. Correlated subqueries um, can also at times uh, execute row by row. They can be a huge bottleneck to performance. One of my favorite things that writes interesting correlated subqueries, Entity Framework. Um, it's just the, the way that it derives, the way that it writes or rewrites that T SQL code from the Lambda expressions that are created inside of this C sharp or VB.NET code. So, <clears throat> when we're looking at performance tuning systems that utilize a object relational mapper and we're looking at code, sometimes elimination of those is something that we would need to do to get faster processing. Now, with cursors and loops, uh, some different characteristics. Um, Explicit cursor declarations, right? So declare cursor, or I don't even know the syntax for it anymore. I used to be able to write it from memory. I was so efficient at it. I thought they were like the best thing in the world until I learned they weren't. Um, but we create a cursor, and then we declare our variables, and for each record that we fetch out of that cursor, we're going to do some kind of processing. We can do the same thing with while loops, right? Essentially, to the engine, a while loop is almost no different. While this is less than this, do this, right? One of my favorites, though, is a SQL data reader. Um, if you have a .NET application that executes a data reader, that is still a row-by-row -row process. And I've worked with customers that they have blocking issues related with a query that runs in one or two seconds but it returns 60, 70, 80,000 records, and their application takes a millisecond per record to do additional processing while it loops that reader. Guess what's gonna happen while the application is iterating or consuming that reader? All of the locks have to be held. And if you look at the session, it has what is a wait type? Async network IO, right? Why? Because it doesn't have TDS buffers to send the data across to the client. The client is not consuming that data set fast enough. So what I usually recommend when we're talking about doing processing with data from SQL Server is open the data reader, consume it, and build a collection in the application, then loop over that collection. Decouple that from the database engine unless you absolutely have to hold those locks for some reason. But most of the time it's not a condition that you need to hold those locks. That way you free the engine back off for execution of other tasks. 
<clears throat> now, the problem is that row-based processing um, is really slow in SQL Server, especially the larger the data set gets. So anybody used a scalar user-defined function and it's really good for like one row, but then you put it in a report and it drags on for days, hours, whatever. That it's very common. Um, the reason that it drags on, and if you look at extended events or SQL Profiler for a trace for really old versions of SQL Server, if you look at the uh, SP completed event, you'll see that it's firing that for every single record in that table or in that result set. It's orders of magnitude slower. So we want to look at how do we replace these with appropriate set-based operations, right? Moving looping code, sometimes into SQL CLR or a middle tier. Take it out of the database. Um, <clears throat> or consuming and disposing of any data readers very quickly. This is one of those things with ETL operations and SSIS packages that do a lot of inline transformations. Uh, pull the data out of the source, stage it, and then iterate off of the staging to do all those transformations. Get those locks out of the production system as quickly as possible. So let's take a look at cursors. And um, I'm gonna be honest, I committed present presenter um, sin this morning. I updated my environment to 2019 RTM from the release candidate. So hopefully all the behaviors are right. I've tested everything, I think, but um, if, it, if there's something that doesn't work out right, you'll see me drop back to 2017 where I was actually gonna demo everything. Um, but because there's changes in UDFs specifically in 2019, I wanted to demonstrate that. And I asked Bob uh, Ward, would you do it on the release candidate or RTM? He was like, RTM. So of course I changed everything right before I came in here. This is a bad idea. So this is actually, if we look down here, connected to my 2019 instance. And I have a version of AdventureWorks that uh, uh, is from the 2014 uh, version or release of SQL Server, but AdventureWorks didn't really change very much. Uh, the reason I use this one is because it has some enlarged tables that I created. And there's a script on my blog. Um, it'll be included in the demos. I pretty much include it in every demo that I create that's called Make Adventure Works Big. Uh, and all it does is copy the sales order header and sales order detail table and then expand them out by inserting more orders into them just so that we can get queries with a specific cost and more row count so that we can demonstrate certain types of, of behaviors. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create a temporary table called scrapped items and we're gonna use a cursor to look over all of our production work orders and <clears throat> we're going to insert into our scrapped items the difference between the due date and the modification date for every one of our product numbers off of our product table. And why would you do it this way? Um, I honestly don't know, it just, it's a demo. Um, but I, <laughs> for, for real. Uh, but I've seen things that, that do stuff like this in customer systems before, and I look at it and go, why would you do that? Uh, and then, I, you know, in some cases I try and think, okay, well, if I was a developer and I didn't really understand SQL necessarily, how would I write this? I would probably write it like this because this is the way I think in terms of looping, right? So we're gonna count how many items were scrapped. We're gonna do a check of the duration with the cursor. And then we're gonna do what actually makes sense, right? We're gonna clear the table, restart our timing, and we're just gonna do a join between production product and work order. And we're gonna calculate what that difference is and just to prove that nothing's different between the record sets, we're gonna count the items and then drop our table. So let's execute this. So we can see here, same row count. But what's the duration with the cursor? 7,403 milliseconds, 7.4 seconds versus 143 milliseconds for the set-based operation, right? 
Um, it, it's phenomenally different when we take that row-based paradigm out. And I've looked at customer systems that have store procedures that do cursor-based operations that a join could have handled. It just wasn't written that way, or somebody didn't understand the right way of making that join potentially, right? So if we can eliminate this, we can already see right here, there's huge performance benefits, and I'm gonna throw that out to full screen. I thought it... Oh, sure, ask questions all, you're, you're here to learn. If you have a question, feel free to ask. You won't mess me up. So the, the, the question, I, I don't know if it's a question, it's more of a comment. Um, the company they work at has chosen to do this against certain tables uh, to avoid blocking issues due to locking the table uh, d during modification from reads. So uh, there's, there's reasons why that might make sense. There's reasons why that doesn't make sense, okay? Uh, just to be completely honest. Um, how do you avoid it? Put no lock. I'm just kidding. Oh my God, I'm just kidding. Um, so how do you avoid it, right? There's, <laughs> do, please don't, don't, do not take that. That was a joke, I swear. <laughs> um, so depending on your workload, no lock actually could help that, right? And, that's the solution a lot of people use. I don't think it's the right one. I don't want my bank to no lock my balance um, when, when somebody else is at the ATM with my debit card taking money out, right? Um, so there's other things that could be used there. Recommitted snapshot isolation might be the answer for you because it uses row versioning in TempDB. Readers don't block writers. Writers don't block readers. Uh, how big is the update or modification that's happening becomes the next question. Um, if it's a lot of records that are being updated, then you can batch it in a loop, but still have it do multiple set-based updates. Uh, and it, it's, I feel like I've used this analogy too many times already this week, and I've only presented this as a second time. How do you eat a whale? one bite at a time, right? But you're not gonna eat it in little nibbles. You're probably gonna take a decent sized bite. You can't put the whole thing in your mouth and chew, but if you take smaller chunks. So if you update it and you iterate 5,000 records at a time, you might prevent triggering lock escalation to the table level lock that creates blocking and other problems, but you still have fewer passes and it'll go faster, right? So there are bulk operations, bulk data modifications are a place that I loop all the time. Why? Because I don't want to take that table level lock and block everything in the system. And I don't want to take the huge transaction log hit of touching every record in the table. I want it to do 50,000 at a time. And it allows it to begin a transaction, commit the transaction, release the locks, clear the log space, back it up, you know, all the things that prevent us from blowing the log out especially when you have something like an availability group or log shipping. You don't want those, those kind of problems to pop up. So there's, cursors might accomplish it, but there's probably a better way to, to address that. If it's a blocking issue, I would look at recommitted snapshot as more of a solution just to prevent readers from blocking writers and writers from blocking readers. Any other questions? Okay, correlated subqueries. Now, the story with correlated subqueries has changed from version to version of uh, SQL Server. So, uh, with correlated subqueries, you have a uh, outer query and an inner query. And usually the inner query is generating a column value. And it references the outer query as a part of the select statement. Or you have a select statement used as a column value in an update. 
Whether this runs row by row, it depends. Uh, I, I don't know all the conditions, honestly. Years ago, SQL 2000, 2005, these were much more prevalent to being row by row iterators. Today, the optimizer does a pretty good job of inlining a lot of these so that you don't even see the impacts or the performance effects of it. Uh, but I'm not a member of the query optimizer team. I don't know all the rules around where these do or don't inline. Um, if it doesn't inline and it goes row by row, performance can have an exponential decrease. So what do we replace this with? A lot of times just a table join or a derived table join where we're generating that row by row operation. For example, let's say we're selecting the max order date for each customer ID. We, well, we could write a derived table that has the customer ID and the max order date from our orders table grouped by the customer ID, and then we join that on customer ID. So instead of it having to go get it row by row, it computes it for the entire set and then joins it back together as a set-based operation. Or in some cases, uh, a table valued function, right? If we need to apply that filter as a part of our criteria, an inline table valued function, um, that's a table valued function that doesn't have a table variable defined in it, just so we're clear, right? It says returns table as select whatever. That cross-applied will allow us to apply that filtering predicate, but it also allows the optimizer to put that code in line and run a set-based operation for us. So let's look at correlated subqueries. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the line total for each product from our sales order detail. And then we're going to calculate the line total times the discount price so that we know what our total discount was. And we're going to base it off of our production product table where the product number is like BK percent. So it starts with the leading letters BK for the product number. And then we're going to filter where our uh, total is not null for the product, meaning we've actually sold that product, and the discount was greater than 1% of our total. So if we execute this, not too shabby, 21 records, and it took 1.4 seconds to run, right? So let's look at, how would we rewrite this? Anybody know? An outer apply? Uh, it could be. Window functions? Maybe. I, that would be more expensive. A CTE with a group by or a derived table is, is the most efficient thing here. Uh, so I, common table expressions are a, a means of organizing code and getting good readability. I, I am very bad with CTE use in demos. Uh, if, if I would have written it as a derived table, that's where it would apply in a CTE. So my code, the demo for this is actually, the, the answer for a CTE is absolutely right. It's the way that most people would write it today. Um, it's the way I would go back and correct it, but because I've used this demo plenty of times, I have never gone back and changed it. So this would be your CTE definition. In fact, we could just do It doesn't like it. Why? Oh, it likes it. It's just complaining. So if I'll save this so that it's a CTE from now on. So 
Um, so we could pull that derived table, the CTE up, right? The, the, the actual logical evaluation of this by the query optimizer is no different whether it's inlined as a CTE or inlined as a derived table. The optimizer, the parse tree of the actual statement is gonna be the same uh, inside of the execution engine. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna run these together and all we've done is taken essentially, this is the sad part, right? One, two, three, four, five row by row operations and we've drawn them up into a single set-based operation here, right? So this computes our product IDs and order detail information for every record in one hit. Then we join that back out to um, our production product information to apply our filter. And if we execute this again, and look at our timings, so this time, correlated subqueries, 993 milliseconds, derived table, 510 milliseconds. That's not that big of a difference, is it? How many people would actually catch that? A couple people, right? But most people wouldn't notice the impact of this. So a couple years goes by, and the size of our data set grows. So now we're gonna go back against our enlarge table. Same two queries. The only difference being the volume of data has changed. So if we go to our timings, the correlated subquery in this case, 1300 milliseconds, but look at our, our derived table or CTE. It's still very consistent, right? The set-based operations, are much more consistent in performance over time, where the set or the loop-based or the row-by-row-based executions are going to start to skew as the data set grows. Yeah. yeah. What about the apply product? Would that give you the same performance? So the question was, what about the outer apply? Would that give the same performance? Uh, so if we do like this, I, hold on one second, and I will, because this isn't, oh, wrong demo. This isn't that hard to rewrite as that. <clears throat> so if we did this, So this would be the equivalent with an outer apply, right? So we're gonna apply our sum total and discount with the product ID filter inside of the apply. And this, is the, this essentially would be the same as if you had a table valued function that could execute in line and took the filter. So if we execute that, what did I do? Oh. Uh, so we, we would have to apply a filter here that has this as well.
So we're going to just grab this. And then we'll copy this back over so we can compare. So that had 21 rows. This has 21 rows. This has 21 rows. So the, the cross apply is essentially the same execution duration, slightly different. Um, if we ran this multiple times, they would probably be pretty much on average with each other. Uh, if we pull the execution plan, though, that one's really ugly. Um, so the bottom two reflect the, the, uh, the cross apply and the, the CTE. They're basically getting the same plan. So either way, now it's a great example. I'm glad you said that, and I'm glad you asked, right? There's more than one way to skin a cat. It's a terrible thing to say. <laughs> Where did that come from? I have four cats. Um, so, so our costs are the same. I can't believe I said that. Our costs are the same. The execution is, is essentially the same between the two. So I'll save the common table expression for you, and I'll save the cross apply for you, and they'll be in the demos. Any other questions? All right, so scalar user-defined functions. This is the fun part. Uh, and this is why I, I took the risk and I updated to SQL 2019. Because 2019 includes inlining of scalar UDFs. Who've, who's heard that? Who who's, can't wait? I'm about to show you you're wrong. So, uh, so it does inline in certain conditions. There are certain conditions it will not inline. Just because it's in lines doesn't mean that it's going to be faster. So, scalar user defined functions are used for encapsulating common code blocks or business logic into a single call that can be reused. If columns are passed as parameters, it will not be in line. It has to go row by row. Uh, some other things that scalar user UDFs cause is a non-parallel zone in your execution plan. So if you have a statement that would have used ex or parallelism as a part of execution, a scalar user-defined function immediately turns that into a serial execution on a single thread. Huge performance blocker. So um, there's a lot of reasons why these should be avoided. Performance decreases exponentially with data access. And one of the really interesting things if you have excessive or very heavy scalar UDF usage in your application, a lot of the third-party monitoring tools cannot monitor your application because of the performance overhead of the events that get generated. Um, or they have to, you have to turn certain parts of their monitoring off. Um, and it's kind of across the board. The problem is not the monitoring tool. The problem is the way your application's working. Um, depending on who, which side of the fence you're sitting on, I guess. Um, so what do we replace these with? A lot of times, uh, I replace them with inline expressions. Uh, sometimes we need to go to a CTE or derived table join. Or uh, if we need to maintain code reuse, I'll go to a cross-joined inline table valued function. For most things that I see scalar functions used, I'm going to be completely honest. Um, my recommendation to customers is take that logic out of the database. It's presentation. It's not something that the database engine necessarily has to do. It's something that the application tier would actually scale better for doing, um, especially when we're talking about presenting information back out. So uh, one of the things that very recently, I want to say maybe two, three weeks ago, I looked at with the customer environment <clears throat> was a scalar user-defined function that was used to pro provide correct title casing for names and strings. Um, and every time a string was modified, 
there was a trigger on tables that used this function. So not only did we affect the performance of every write, but now we're having to do it row by row. And it started to create massive blocking issues um, for something that I would say, does the, unless you have a case sensitive collation, does the database really care what casing data is stored in? No. Um, my question was, why doesn't the application just apply the appropriate casing logic before it sends the data to the database? Um, because it, it's all coming in through stored procedures. Why isn't it being applied by the application as a part of the business rules uh, for this specific problem? But um, let's look at our scalar user defined function performance. So for simplicity's sake, I, what I'm doing is um, I'm, I'm going to be a good developer. And that last correlated subquery thing that I wrote, well, we need to use that sum total and discount in more than one place. So we're just going to take it out of that, and we're going to put it in a function. right? So our function calculates our line total by product ID, and then our discount total by product ID. And now we have the same logical expression, but instead of having the correlated subqueries, we have our scalar functions. So we're evaluating exactly the same thing. And if we execute this, five seconds. And uh, notice I'm on 2019. If we look at our execution plan, did it inline? Yeah, it did. But was it faster than the correlated subquery? No, not even close, right? So let's go change our compatibility mode. Now let's drop back to 120, which turns inlining off, and run this again. One second. Oh my god, that's such a great feature. <laughs> uh, who's excited about inlining now? Not a hand goes up. So now, let's look at the difference in our execution plan. Somebody's not being very honest here, right? This is the problem with scalar UDFs, is they don't populate or show up in the execution plan. If we look at our statistics I.O., they don't show up there. It's all hidden from us, and you don't realize the impacts that this is having. So let's go to, uh, I'm going to avoid the. Usually, I, this is where I go, we're just going to use Profiler really quick, but Aaron Stilato might be somewhere around here to kill me. <laughs> so we're going to go to Extended Events. We're going to create a new session. We're going to start the session and watch live data. And we're going to add our SQL batch completed event, or batch starting and completed. Stop it. And our module end event. So module end fires anytime a store procedure trigger or function completes execution. Um, <clears throat> within the module end event, if we look at the statement, um, we can track the individual statement, but it will also tell us the object type, right? So object type fn is going to be our function. So we're just going to start that, come back over here and execute this again.
So we got 351 events for 21 rows. 351 events for 21 rows. Um, that's a lot, right? Let's look at, let's stop this. Group by our name. So out of that 333 module end events, those functions fired 331 times, or 33 times. Who knew that was happening behind the scenes? Now, let's clear this. We're gonna do, recreate those functions, but we're gonna go against our enlarge tables. And we're gonna run this again. Stop this. Group by that column. It took the same number of executions, right? Even though the data set's bigger that it's calculating, it's based on the outer side. So if we were to get more products, we would see more executions of this. This is where this starts to grow kind of exponentially. Um, so when we look at the performance of this against our large table, it's one second. It's not too bad. But if we go back and compare it to our derived table here, Eight forty-six versus four ninety. That derived table has stayed consistent here, hasn't it? We've been right around four eighty, four ninety, five hundred. It's very consistent, and it's set based. is is one of the biggest things that drives it. So, what if we wanted to change this up, right? Let's say we needed to reuse this computation. We actually needed this. How do we do it so that we get the code reuse, but we don't take the performance hit? This is where inline table valued functions can be useful, right? So we take that scalar value, we change it to an inline expression, and we create a function that's TVF get sales total by product ID, returns a table, as return, select the line total. Now, a better optimization would be to make this, instead of two functions, to make it one function that returns the discount and the line total, but that's not the demo I wrote. So, um, we're just going to compare this with two separate functions. And the way that you would use this is by doing a cross apply. So here we're going to cross apply those two functions. We're going to provide the product ID very similar to the cross apply of the inline expression that, that was brought up earlier. It's just using the functions and then we're going to compute our duration. Oh, you're right. Yeah, so even without the filter on the discount value, it's 500 milliseconds. Um, I can go back and add the filter. It's just going to reduce the amount of network packets coming through um, at this point. Um, so, but this is how you get that code reuse. Right, and this is, this is one of those areas that can be really, really useful. Now, one of the most common places that I see scalar user defined functions used is around string parsing, right? Who has something that they, they need to break parts of strings down and other stuff and you do it in a function. So this is where set-based theory becomes really important. If we stop thinking about data in terms of this, and we think of it in terms of this, we can use the same set-based operations. How do we do that? Anybody know? 
Who knows who Jeff Moden is? Jeff Moden is a, a, a tally tables, yeah, number tables, is a frequent blogger, writer, uh, forum answerer on SQL Server Central, and he has a number of articles on using tables of numbers uh, and tally tables for per solving performance problems. So what we're gonna look at here is um, an example of that title casing function. Um, and in this case, what they do is they, they take an input string and what they're looking for is they iterate character by character doing a substring. And if it's the first character in the string, it's allowed to be uppercase. If it's a subsequent character, it should be lowercase, unless it follows a space, a colon, a semicolon, a tab, a carriage return, then it should be uppercase. If it follows an apostrophe, if it's an S, it should be lowercase. If it's not an S, it should be uppercase. How do we apply all of these rules in a set-based fashion? Well, first, we've got to stop thinking about the string in terms of horizontal. We need to turn it on its side. So what we're going to do, and I actually broke this demo down for demonstrate like logic purposes so that you can think through this problem in terms of set. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a table of numbers. Uh, and in this case, I'm just using master SPT values because it exists. And it, if you filter on type equals P, there's numbers 0 to 2048 already built into that table. If you need more than 2048, create a simple table of numbers. There used to be a script I created online that was an example of how to create a numbers table. It had the values um, 0 to, I forget, it was like 4 million something. But it was, a, a, it, it was building basically the max value of an in, integer into a numbers table. Do you need one that big? No. Um, and I removed it when somebody uh, got really upset that they created that numbers table without ever looking at what the script did on an express edition database and ran it out of space. So um, there's a lot of examples of how to create a numbers table. It's just a single column with incrementing values. There's examples online of how to do it with a common table expression as well. When it gets too big, the CTE starts to slow down. Uh, so having it persisted can be useful. But we're going to take this input string, A, B, C, S, W, 123, Disney World, Johnson's, whatever, testing John's function test. And we're going to break it down using our numbers table. So we're going to do a substring of our input string using that numbers table. And if we look at what the result of this is as our raw data, we just took that string and turned it on its side. Now we have a table with ordinal position in every character. Who knows how to work with that? That's pretty easy, right? Now we can do a join between those two, uh, between this to itself. So we take that raw data, and if we join from that CTE back to itself, and we're going to join on the number column being minus one of the other side so we can see what the previous character is. So this is our first character. There's no previous character. So within our case logic right here, we can apply all of the business rules that I just described, right? So if the current character is an S, and the previous character was an apostrophe, make it lowercase. Well, it, this doesn't say make it lowercase, it just leaves it. Um, but we, it could say too lower or lower here. When the previous character is one of our control characters that we want to force uppercase for as the subsequent character, then we do the upper of the current character space. Otherwise, 
Make it a lowercase character. Very simple case logic here, right? That defines all of those business rules. And if we look at our result set, does this follow the rules that I said? It's, it's uppercase everywhere it's supposed to be. It's lowercase for the S's, following apostrophes. It follows those rules. Who knows how to turn this back into a string? Almost everybody, right? You can use 4XML path. You could use concat. Um, there's lots of ways that you could do it. Do not use a function, a scalar function, that does the a, a pin thing that everybody used to do, right? We're, we're, we're trying to get rid of that. So let's look at our total solution for that string cleaning. So we're going to use our number CTE, break the data down, apply our business logic, and then we're going to do for XML path type and generate our output string. And because this is a inline table valued function, if we applied this across multiple rows in a table, it would be very efficient. It would be inlined into the operation. So <clears throat> it's, it's just a, another way of doing this and doing it without the performance impact. And I've used this for things like uh, comma separated values that get sent from third parties that have duplicate data that we need to deduplicate. We can dedupe it inline as a part of ETL operations. Um, I've used it for removing invalid data from things like phone number sets, right? If a phone number doesn't follow a certain format or it has non-numeric values, is that a valid number in a comma-separated string? Usually not. It could be, but it's something that we might want to flag for some personal review or you know, some better uh, understanding of what's happening there. And if you execute this, it will run in line. Any questions? So if we look back at our inlining really quick, where did it go? So the database compat level, if we go back to 150 and we run this again, so we're back out to our five second execution time. One of the biggest things here, and I, I actually was talking to, to um, a couple of the product group guys about this, because I was like, you know that doesn't run faster, right? Um, I have a couple of cases that'll prove it. So it doesn't hide anything from you, right? This tells you what's happening where the other doesn't. It tells you we have one, two, three, four, five iterations of that function here that have been in line, right? Here, 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 and here. So what if we change our query? What if we change it so that we calculate the function? We could do this as a CTE as well. I told y'all I'm bad at CTEs. I, it's just not the way my brain works until I'm cleaning code up and then I go back and put it in. So here we can say where our sum total is not null and our discount is greater than 1%. So if we re-execute that and look at our plan, This is our original query. This is our rewrite that only uses the two functions. Now we see it's inlined, but our cost is lower. And if we look at our total duration, it's about half as much. So by eliminating those extra function calls that were happening and, and uh, converting it over to a common table expression or in uh, a derived table, we can actually make improvements here, even though 
it's nowhere near as fast as just writing the derived table or common table expression cross apply that originally was there, right? So yes, it helps a little, but it's, it's not the like silver bullet. I wish it was, I really do. Um, we, we've had a, a number of customer workloads where I'm like, scalar function is, your scalar function usage is just killing you. Hopefully 2019 will solve it. Uh, now I'm not so uh, excited about that because it, it's uh, definitely not making it faster necessarily, but it is showing that they're there. Yes. The question is, uh, with the demo that I ran on the smaller table, if I, if I moved it to the larger table, with the inlining, would it make a difference? Um, in this case, no. Because the number of executions is driven by the product table, which is the outer side, and the, the row count is the same. So we're getting the same number of iterations of that function every time. Um, it, it, it's not gonna have the, as big of an impact. If it, if it was inverted and we were driving on a larger data set and having to execute the function exponentially more times, then potentially, yes, there would be a big, a big difference there. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, the question is, did the inlining start with 2019? You have to be in compat mode 150 on 2019 for it to inline. That's why there's the alter database compatibility mode at the top, and I set it back to 120 to show that it doesn't inline and it runs faster non-inlined versus inlined, where it takes five seconds versus the one. So you're talking about with string parsing or string processing, like breaking down a, a comma-separated list using CLR versus the tally table. So it, it's, a, it's an it depends. Uh, if you go to sqlperformance.com, Aaron Bertrand has four different articles that test breaking down comma-separated values uh, using a numbers table using common table expressions using 4XML, using JSON, and using string underscore split in 2017 and higher. Um, that method became the fastest one according to the last article that was written. Uh, there's a lot of argument that happens in some of the comments. Read the comments because um, there's arguments about changes to certain semantics and what it allows or doesn't allow or what should or should not be done. Uh, for different performance things, and that's why there's four articles that retest a number of things. Uh, string length is one of the things that matters. How many objects are in that string is one of the things that matters, and it breaks down all the, like what the tipping point for each one where it performed better or worse was. And um, I, I reference it all the time. Uh, so I, I, I go back and look at it all the time. But CLR can, can perform faster, especially on bigger strings. Um, the native string underscore split that's in SQL Server now, uh, to my knowledge, is the fastest way to do it. If you're if you're just splitting. Title case. Oh, for title case. But they're not native in SQL, right? So yeah, so you would have to do CLR. The CLR functions are going to execute row by row still. Unfortunately, so uh, that's where, if you were gonna write it in CLR, why are you putting that in your database? Why not just put it in your application and send it to the database, correct? 
Is, it, that's my biggest argument back to people that want to do that. So why are we offloading this to the database tier? Especially when, how much does it cost to license IIS? It's pretty cheap compared to Enterprise Edition of SQL Server, right? $7,000 a core so that we can set the title case on a string doesn't make sense. Um, and that's usually when I start talking return on investment and total cost of making this type of a change, it starts to line back up and it gets moved back out. Any other questions? All right, so. The question is, if you have a function in the where clause, does it impact parallelism? If you have a function in the statement at all, parallelism is inhibited. It's a parallel inhibitor. So if you look at the execution plan, it's, it'll say non-parallel plan reason, reason, and it has user-defined function listed there. So sargability. Uh, sargability is where we have a search argument able uh, expression that allows an index seek to occur as a part of speeding up query execution. Some anti-patterns for this, functions in the where clause um, are, are one of them. Uh, implicit or explicit data type conversions on a column. If we're changing the data type of data, uh, the optimizer in certain cases has to read everything because it changes the meaning of the data. My absolute favorite, convert varchar 10, date time field, comma 101. Who's got it? I've written it a thousand times as a developer. I didn't know how bad it was or why it didn't do what I wanted it to do. But that forces an index scan. It will always force an index scan. Today, just cast it as a date if you need to cut the time off of it. If you have older versions of SQL Server, there's a way to do like a date add, date diff thing that still treats it as a date, but it lops the time off that allows it to run really, really fast. So be very careful with that. Implicit conversions, your schema doesn't match your filter criteria. Huge problem, we see it all the time. Uh, in fact, it's one of my favorite things to look for because it's easy money. It's easy to fix, right? Change the schema or change the data type. But if you have a varchar schema and you're using an nvarchar or Unicode filter, let me take that back. If you are from the US and you're a next, 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 next installer, because this is a specifically US problem, I learned when a guy from China sent me an um, email and said, it doesn't work the way you said it does. Because the collation is different in China. They use a binary collation that it doesn't have the same semantics. But if you use SQL Latin one general case insensitive, apostrophe sensitive, collation, whatever that CAPI, blah, 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 thing is, um, that's the default of SQL Server. A uh, comparison of a non-Unicode string to a Unicode string forces a table scan if the non-Unicode value is in the table because it has to move up in precedence. So. Uh, the most common places we see that, object relational mappers. Uh, if, if they haven't been set to use ASCII parameters or non-Unicode parameters, it's gonna come across as a invar chart data type. And how do you fix it? Change the schema to match what's being parameterized. Um, is a lot of times the fast fix. You're not gonna go back and rip out all that entity code or whatever else. Leading wildcard expressions. So you get like percent and then a search term. This is a, actually a really interesting thing um, with entity framework. Uh, as a part of trying to build some uh, entity framework code for Aaron to be able to do some query store demos, uh, one of the things that I did is in .NET I wrote, everything was a dot .contains against my entity. Guess what that does? It produces wildcard search strings. When what I actually should have done was a dot starts with, which removes the leading percent. But if you're .NET devs, 
say doc contains, which is, to me, that's a very common thought process, right? Um, the string contains this value. What it sends across is a non-sargable expression to SQL Server. And if it really should be starts with, they need to use starts with so that it sends it across appropriately. Or my favorite, one size fits all stored procedures and queries. Who has the, the stored procedure that has like 10 nullable parameters? And the where clause says where column equals parameter value or parameter value is null in parentheses. Ooh. So go to sqlskills.com. Look up Kimberly Tripp, OSFA, one size fits all. She has a solution for you. You're not going to like it. It creates a lot of red text in Management Studio, but it will perform way better. So catch all queries are really problematic. Um, I've had to fix a number of these for customers over the years. Uh, my favorite was a customer where I, I sent back a solution for one of their catch all queries, and it used dynamic SQL, and they forwarded it out to, the DBAs forwarded it out to the dev team, and the developers didn't realize that I was on the CC list. And their lead developer replied back, of course he solved it that way. Who can read red text? He's a consultant trying to make money. And I had a really good laugh about this, because I was like, uh, <laughs> Trust me, if you can solve this another way, by all means, go ahead. Because how many different permutations of parameters exist with five parameters that could be nullable? Does anybody know? 125, it's five factorial. Five times four times three times two times one, right? At a sixth one, how many now exist? 700 and bleh. Who's going to write that many individual stored procedures and have it give logic to break that? Nobody, right? It, 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 it becomes an incrementally big problem. So functions in the where clause. Some of the characteristics, uh, you're changing the data stored to match the criteria being create or checked. Conversion to a different data type, it's going to cause an index scan over a seek. Uh, replace it with proper table design to support your business needs. Uh, potentially an index persistent computed column, but watch out with check DB, because it has to recheck every single value in the table when it runs, and that can be a very long run time. Paul, has a, Paul Randall has a blog post on this. Uh, maybe an index view or some other coding paradigm to get a sargable expression. Implicit and explicit column conversions. Um, the column side of the expression is of lower precedence. This is important. Uh, there is, if you search SQL Server data type precedence, there's a books online article that has every data type in the order of precedence. If it's at a lower precedence, it has to move up that list. Um, this is very common with linked to SQL, entity framework, and other object relational mappers if the schema wasn't designed around avoiding this. Uh, again, we get a table or index scan over a seek, replace the column with a higher precedence data type, or match your data type for filtering parameters back to the original source schema. And then the catch-all queries is what I just talked about, right? Our where clause is similar to param is null or column equals param. Um, it's so funny because when you try and search online, there's so many articles and blog posts and topics that have this as a, this is how you do this, right? And I wish that I could go clean all of them up because it, it just, it's such a pervasive problem and What's really bad is you get really wild execution plans with these. Um, depending on what compiled parameter set came in when it compiled, you could have a plan that causes the system to go to 100% CPU under the rest of your workload. It's very, very common. In fact, Kimberly worked with a customer that, I, like, it's really sad, I hate to say this, but because she was a woman, they would not follow her advice to fix it. Um, and they, every time they had a problem, they had to fail their cluster over. And they would rather fail their cluster over than take her advice for some reason. It was really weird. 
Um, so she told him, instead of doing the failover, put this job in place that looks for these bad values in the, the plan cache and we'll free the plan cache when they pop up. Um, and this was years and years ago. She, she tells the story when she talks about her one size fits all procedures. Um, and I think she has like a six or eight hour course on Pluralsight for optimizing procedural code that talks about this. So when they did that, they, they had this job that was running their server go to 100% CPU. A few minutes later, it would catch that the bad plan was there and it would clear the plan cache and it would go away. And then half an hour later, 45 minutes later, it would go back to 100 CPU and then it would go away. And it was because of recompilation of this one size fits all procedure with parameters that just didn't work. So then they actually took her advice and implemented the full fix. So let's take a look at what the full fix for that is. So what we're gonna do is <clears throat> we're going to create our parameters, order date, account number. I'm not doing this in a stored procedure, I'm just doing it inline so that I can change values pretty easily. Um, we're gonna set a value for our, our account number, and then we're gonna do the one size fits all query pattern. So where the order date is greater than or equal to our order date, or it's null, or the account number, or and the account number is our account number, or it's null. What does this create? It creates an always true expression evaluation, right? Either the order date is gonna match or the order date was null. <laughs> Those are both, it's gonna always be true. That's like putting where one equals one into this expression. So let's look at what we get for our execution plan. So you can see here we have a clustered index scan of our sales order header table, and we have a predicate that's being evaluated, but we're having to scan both of these tables. Let's change our filter now. We're gonna set our order date and not set our account number. Did the execution plan change? Nope. So our parameter runtime value is set here <clears throat> um, and our account number is null, but we get the same plan. What if we do it as dynamic SQL? And I, so I, I usually don't put the where one equals one, but it doesn't affect performance if it's there and it can simplify this. So I leave it in the demo because if you try and read all my case logic that determines whether it should have a where clause or not, you'll probably go to heck with that. I'll just deal with the problem. So um, we put it there and what we're gonna look at is is the order date null? When the order date's not null, then we're gonna add and order date greater than or equal to the order date. Otherwise, put nothing. Then we're gonna check, is the account number null? If it's not, add the account number filter. That way we only get the filter criteria that's required for the parameters that are set. So let's execute this, and we're gonna use SP execute SQL, passing our parameters in, we're using dynamic string execution, but it's parameterized still, right? This is not a dynamic SQL injection. We're not concatenating values in. So we're gonna execute this. Here's our execution plan. And then here's our execution plan with the dynamic SQL. So, Uh, 
Well, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, they're both doing scans, but Let's change the parameter really quick. Uh, so usually I run this and then I, I say let's go create this missing index and then it changes that second query. Um, but if we look at the difference here, right, um, with just our account number filter added in, we still have an index scan of the sales order header table, but now we have a clustered index seek of our detail, where up here we have a scan of it. If we add both parameters in, here we still get the same execution plan up here, but down here we have the modified execution plan. And it's specific because now we have our order date and our account number filters applied. Something's wrong with that. Oh, it pulled both of them from, from the plan for both of these. So this is a much more efficient means of executing that code. Now, the more parameters, the more important it is. The more tables, the more important it is. Because you start driving these scans against multiple tables with no seeks, and performance is going to be impacted. Can you run the query with recompile? Yes. You could. What's the recompile impact? If it's a query that runs 10,000 times a minute, it'll sync your server. The recompile CPU overhead will, will bring the server workload down. So uh, option recompile can be used in some cases. If, if it's a one-size-fits-all scenario, I wouldn't put option recompile on it. I would change the way we're doing it so that we don't have that recompile overhead. Because recompile costs CPU and there's compile gateway limits that you could hit on the compiler, and you can end up with resource semaphore query compile weights because you have something that has option recompile set that shouldn't. Um, so I'm very careful about not using option recompile unless I really have to. So <clears throat> the last two slides, uh, just some quick takeaways. Develop and test against realistic scale. Um, this is one of my pet peeves. Uh, if you're using uh, scalar user-defined functions specifically, they behave differently against small data sets than they do large. The impact of performance against larger data sets is uh, significant, and you won't see it until it starts to grow out. And then the other thing, profile your workload with extended events um, so you know what's happening. If you profile your workload, you'll see the row-by-row -row execution of functions. So session evaluations are due Friday by 5 p.m. Uh, if you want to win a prize, you can download the guidebook for pass. And thank you for attending this talk. <laughs>